I'm just going to offer you six rays of hope that race realism can be made mainstream. And one of them is in two parts, so perhaps it's really seven. One, politics follows culture. Big cultural changes don't happen because of politics. Far more often, politics follows culture, often reluctantly. Homosexual marriage didn't go from being a joke to being conventional wisdom because politicians willed it so. The politicians tagged along behind media and show business elites who in turn were capitalizing on changes of sensibility in the broad upper middle classes. So that's my ray of light number one. Politics follows culture. Number two, nothing grows to the sky. Public attitudes ebb and flow. The English Puritans banned Christmas and stoned adulterers. Fifty years later came the license and gaiety of the Restoration. A century and a half later, Regency dissipation gave way to Victorian primness. How much further can we go in the direction of reality denial and ethnomasochism? The nation has twice voted for Barack Obama as president, an affirmative action hire whose previous executive experience was running a playgroup in Chicago. What next? President Dwayne Elizondo Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho? <laughs> Those of you who get the reference. Number three, redressing the balance. George Canning, a 19th century British foreign secretary who encouraged Spain's South American colonies to seek their independence, Canning, as every English schoolboy used to know, boasted that he had called the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old. Race realism may come to acceptance by a reverse process, the old world redressing the balance of the new. This is the two-parter. Number three, A, the balance may be redressed from the western end of Eurasia as the European current European trend to more nationalistic parties getting more acceptance comes across the Atlantic. Uh, point three, part B, the balance may be redressed from the other end of the Eurasian landmass, the Asian end, as China, which is uh, very race realist, uh, becomes a major power. When Taylor Wang went, in, went into orbit on the space shuttle in 1985, China's government TV network marveled that he was, quote, the first descendant of the Yellow Emperor to travel in space. Even in the aggressively Anglo-Saxon USA of 1961, it's hard to imagine Walter Cronkite hailing Alan Shepard as the first descendant of Alfred the Great to travel in space. <laughs> Four, good for the Jews. I don't think it's controversial to say that in bringing about big cultural changes in our country, Jewish elites in the media, arts, show business, and the intelligentsia have immensely disproportionate influence. They have been energetic proponents of multiculturalism and white race guilt. But the mass immigration of anti-Semitic Muslims into European countries may turn this around. Five, genomic technology. Technology creates tremendous cultural transformations. TV, cheap air travel, the contraceptive pill, genomic science coming up. When people, when uh, designer babies are routine and gen genetic and genomic topics are everyday conversation among middle class people, race realism will be much more acceptable. Finally, number six, a possible breakup of the two-party system. We're so used to two-party politics, we think it's cast in stone. It's not. It may be just a legacy from the industrial age. If the two-party duopoly is broken, there will be more political space for viewpoints out of the mainstream and more general willingness to engage with them. Six points of light. Thank you. <laughs>